Season 2, Episode 3, Netflix Unsolved Mysteries. Welcome back. Just got done watching this one. Uh, Lester Eubanks, the fugitive from justice. We'll get into all that. But first, uh, happy Veterans Day. Yesterday was a very important day to me as well. It was Marine Corps birthday. So Semper Fi, you see I'm decked out in my Marine Corps uh, gala. Uh, SFMF right here. If you don't know what that means, ask a Marine. Uh, so Semper Fi, happy birthday to the Marine Corps. 10 November 1775, Tons Tavern, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Marine Corps was born. So uh, happy birthday, Marines. Veterans Day today. Uh, it's a day that we should all thank a veteran for our freedom. And I don't care if you were in the Air Force, you are in the Army, you are in the Navy, you are in the Coast Guard, or my beloved Marine Corps. We all served. And a big thank you to everybody who served. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into this Episode 3, Lester Eubanks. Wrote some notes, just got done with it. Uh, a couple of things that stick out to me on this one. Okay, a uh, little background, Lester Eubanks, 1965, a girl named Mary Ellen Diener, 14 years old, she goes to the laundromat at night, uh, I believe with her sister, if it wasn't a sister, it might have been a close friend of hers, to dry some clothes. They run out of change, she leaves by herself to go to another laundromat in order to get the change to come back to dry the clothes. She never comes back. Please find the body the next day. In the meantime, uh, they find that she is found, she is shot to death. This is very key. I want to hone in on this then here in a little bit. Uh, long story short, they were able to track down that ammunition to a firearm that was bought in Mansfield, Ohio, where this crime occurred. They interviewed a gentleman named uh, Lester Eubanks, who was a black male. The victim also was black male uh, or black female. This is important too, and I'll get into why. Uh, he confesses to the crime, and he is arrested. He goes to trial, he testifies at his own trial, and according to the Netflix Unsolved Mystery episodes, he confesses again at the trial. So obviously he's convicted and is sentenced to death. I believe uh, this was in 1966. In 1972, I believe the death, the death penalty was abolished and all people that were under the death penalty are now commuted to life sentences and this would include Lester Eubanks. Um, so that, that's the long and short of this. Um, I want to jump back to the crime and I want to explain something very uh, meticulously to you and to especially uh, other detectives or want to be uh, criminal justice people, especially criminal profiling. Okay, criminal profiling is it has a big name, right? It, it's what the FBI uses, and um, they made movies about it. Mine Hunter, the Netflix show, great show. Uh, I think David Fickner produced that. He's the same person that. Uh, did the movie Zodiac, which if anyone hasn't watched the movie Zodiac and you want a real life account, I'm here to tell you, I got to read the police reports from the Zodiac killings. Um, and I was very privileged to do that for the show uh, Hunt for the Zodiac on the History Channel, which as you know that you're watching this channel probably that uh, I starred in along with uh, Salo Barber. So anyhow, what I'm trying to get at is that Zodiac movie with Robert Downey Jr. and Jake uh, Gyllenhaal, I think is how you pronounce his name. Very accurate. Very accurate. The dialogue between uh, Brian, is it Hartnett? Brian uh, and Cecilia, who got killed uh, at the uh, at the lake. 
what the dialogue between the Zodiac killer and them is almost verbatim taken right from that police report. So if you want to know uh, the most up to date or most realistic uh, Zodiac film, in my opinion, you watch that Zodiac movie. So anyhow, uh, back to criminal profiling. It doesn't always work, okay? It's a tool. Okay, I, I've used it. You know, I, I would never say that I'm a criminal profiler. I would say that I'm more of a crime scene assessment type of person. But I've seen criminal profiling that is not accurate. Okay, and uh, that's that's no fault of the criminal profilers. I mean, I'm not bad mouthing at all. They they get a lot right. Yeah, nobody's 100% right. But why I'm bringing that up is this scene. Let's say you come to this scene as an investigator and you see a 14 year old child, black female, murdered in an alleyway and she's shot. Okay, to me, if I'm going to that scene, I, imag I immediately think maybe she's a witness. Um, it, maybe this was a domestic dispute of some sort, even though that doesn't really fit what I'm getting at is she was shot. You would not initially look at a sex offender because according to at least to the show, I didn't see the autopsy report. It doesn't show that she was sexually assaulted. Now that's key because as an investigator, okay, well, we're not looking at sex offenders. She wasn't sexually assaulted and she was shot. If she was strangled or she was stabbed where it's a crime of I don't want to say passion, but up close and and personal in your space, being shot sometimes is a distance type thing where it's not personal per se. You know that's why a lot of mob hits are, are shot. They're, they're guns. Now sometimes they are strangled and and so on and so forth, but that's why they're called hits. They're done from a distance. They're shot. So when you find a 14 year old female shot. Uh, black female and the reason I keep going back to black female is because uh, usually way we were taught earlier I would say from the 90s going back to the 60s when this crime occurred you were looking for the same race that serial murderers and that maybe sometime not serial murders um, but more likely serial murders than than just random murders is done by the person of the same race. So, you know, a white male kills white female. They don't kill black females. Now, I think Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, proved that theory uh, wrong. And we have seen, we have since seen, I think there was a serial killer from Texas uh, that proved that theory is, you know, they debunked that as well. But, Put yourself as an investigator, as I did while I'm watching this. I go to the scene, I find the 14-year-old black female shot, not sexually assaulted. You're not looking at sex offenders. Uh, what are you looking at? Are you looking at somebody that was getting to testify at court? Somebody that's at the wrong place at the wrong time, witnessed a robbery? That would make sense in my mind. Um, but no. Lo and behold, when they track the gun back to Lester Eubanks, he is a serial sexual predator, according to the show. Very important that they got his confession. And what he confessed to basically was he, I didn't see in there that he said that he was going to sexually assault her, but he was, his intents were not good with her and he had grabbed her. Now, the only reason he's grabbing her is for sexual gratification of some sort. Um, so you can infer that he was going to sexually assault this girl. And maybe if you read the entire police report, if I got it, it would say that. But I'm just, again, going off of the show. But she fought back, uh, said something about, I paused it on his confession that was typed out and was reading it about him. She raised the soda. She was drinking a soda at that time. She raised it above her mouth like he was. she was going to hit him with it and he blocked it. Um, so he ended up shooting her. Uh, so when you go to that scene, 
Okay, again, you're finding a gunshot victim. It's not, it is not linked to a sexual assault. And as an investigator, at least at, for me, immediately I would not think sexual assault. This guy, Lester Eubanks, was actually out on bond for a rape. Okay, that could be miscarriage of justice, number one. But trust me, it gets a lot worse. Okay, so... He, he shoots her because she fought she fights back. She started to scream and he silenced her now This guy went home and he changed clothes Went back out. He was going to go dancing or to a dance club or something went back to the same way that he had killed her and He saw her not dead. She was writhing in pain according to the episode So he picked up a brick and they pretty much stopped the episode there didn't say what happened, but again, you can infer that he probably smashed her head in with a brick. He goes home and changes again. Um, that's important. You know, it shows what type of person he is. He's very thoughtful on the ramifications of possibly being spotted by an eyewitness or if he got blood on him, what not. Um, let me see what I have written down here. Again, so the scene is not indicative of a sexual assault. And the crime itself, being shot twice, is not indicative of a sexual assault. It happens, okay? A lot of sexual assaults, you know, you, you could use a gun, obviously, to force the person into giving you what they want and then you you can shoot them or whatnot but in my experience mostly the sexual assaults that i've seen that end in murder do not end in a gunshot they end in strangulation or they end in blunt force trauma or they end with um a stabbing of some sort so but in this case it throws it all out the window it just goes to show you as an investigator that you never know what you're getting into just by looking at the scene doing your crime scene assessment you can't put on blinders let's say when you first got there now you're saying you know what we're not looking at a sexual offender we're looking at whatever it is gunshot wound and so we're looking at something else if you did that in this case you probably would not have found the offender, which these guys did. And one of the things I want to point out is the three main police officers, maybe four on this episode, to me, you know, right off the bat, real cops. They care. You could tell the one guy in the white shirt who was the captain at one point in time, uh, he was passionate about this case. And that's how I know this case will be solved because people like him will not give up. So a lot of the other episodes, Alonzo Brooks, you know, I was very critical of the police. And I'm allowed to be critical if people are not doing their job. Not in this case. These guys are doing their job that they showed on the episode. Now let me tell you who did not do their job. Okay. This guy is sentenced to death. 1972, the death, death penalty gets abolished, and he's life in prison. Somehow, through his good behavior, he, he works up to this honor system. Okay, I get that. They still have that today in some sort. You good behavior, you, you, know, you get a little extra privileges here and there. But let me tell you about what this guy got. Let me tell you about his privileges. This guy... They allow him to go unsupervised to the local mall to go Christmas shopping. Are you freaking kidding me? What kind of program were they trying to install here by letting a serial rapist, a child killer, convicted not allegedly he confessed and you were going to let this guy go to a mall where there's kids unsupervised and say 
and be back here at 6 o'clock tonight and report back to your prison cell. Oh my God! I am appalled that this happened. Miscarriage of justice is not even the right word. I would want to speak to the person who approved this program. I'm hoping it wasn't just one person. You know, I hope that they sat around and said, who all is in favor of letting these uh, convicted killers and child molesters uh, and bank robbers that are threats to public but have been good in this prison uh, unsupervised and let them go to the mall? Let's take a vote. I, 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 because I'd want to talk to every single one of them and tell them to their face that they're freaking idiots. Are you kidding me? That disgusts me. Think of how the victim's family must have felt to learn that. You're just re-victimizing the family by doing that. You can't blame Lester Eubanks. He's like, oh, you know what? I got to be back at 6. By 5 o'clock, I'm gone. I'm a free man. And he did exactly what I would have done if I was in prison. Can't give that option. Well, uh, speechless. I've seen some stupid things in law enforcement in my time. But I've so far, I don't think I've seen anything as egregious as unjustified as this let me repeat that real quick in case you didn't hear me the first time they let a convicted child murderer and serial sexual offender unsupervised to go Christmas shopping in the mall Nineteen seventy three he escapes. He walked out of that mall. Whether he did it with the help of family, which is probable, uh looking at his log books, I guess he had an increase in visitations um before he escaped. They interviewed his father and years later they were convinced that he helped his son. My thoughts are just scattered right now because I keep going back to thinking how these idiot people would think it would be a good idea to let this convicted offender go to the mall. Unsupervised. Even if it was supervised, it's a bad idea. But you're unsupervised. Anyhow. He escapes. 1973, he's gone. End of the story. They were able to track him... Uh, when he got out, he ended up going to his pen pal's house. Uh, she provided a lot of information years later on how he escaped, his routes, his fake name, I think was Vince uh, something. I want to say Vince Young, but it could have been, but I think of Vince Young. I think of a quarterback from uh, Tex um, and later with the Houston Oilers. But... Uh, the miscarriage of justice. This guy has never been caught. He escaped. 1973. After he committed the murder in, what, 1965. And the third miscarriage of justice is that after 20 years, somebody finally was smart enough to check the system to see if his escape warrant was entered into NCIC. And apparently it had not. Clerical error? Probably. Probably, you know, obviously a mistake. Uh, not nearly big of a mistake as these idiot people that voted to let him go to the mall. But still a mistake nonetheless. Can't correct that until 20 years later they find out, they re-enter it. Uh, so anyhow, how do you catch this guy? Okay, I worked uh, with the U.S. Marshals a lot. Very good at what they do. And I believe they will find him if he's still alive. Now, uh, what would I look for? Okay, if I'm looking for, it's a, essentially, he, it's a missing person. I would look for his talents, which is 
art. Usually if somebody has talent for something, uh, they will try to make money off of that. Okay? So I don't see that this guy is painting and doing artistry as a hobby. He may. But I think he would be trying to sell that to make money. However, if he's able to get gainful employment, which it seems that he had at a mattress factory and so on and so forth, uh, he may be doing it as a hobby, but I think he would continue to do it. So you obviously look that route. Um, you know, go to paint supply stores in areas where he may or may not have family. They're focusing on where he has contacts, friends and relatives. And they, they U.S. Marshals always do that. And 90% of the time, they're right. But as you grow older, this guy is, I believe, probably in his 60s by now, maybe 70s. Um, you may not necessarily be around family. Those people might not be around anymore and you can, you've established roots already somewhere. So, uh, I wouldn't necessarily be looking around family or friends. Uh, I would do a complete victimology. Well, let me rephrase that. You know how I am on victimology. But this punk is not a victim. He's a suspect. So you would do a suspectology on him and find out such things as where did he live in the past and why did he live there? Okay, now why is that important? What if you find out that he worked in Alabama, which they did on the show, ties to Florida. He also had some ties to Detroit, but did he like warm weather? Because then, you know, you're cutting your states that you have to look at in half. You can focus on Florida. Or you can focus in on Alabama, places like that. But you don't know that until you dig into his background and find out where he had lived and why he had lived there. Um, it, it's easy to disappear in America. It really is. Uh, as long as you stay out of trouble. Whitey Bulger did it for decades. You know, he was the uh, famed mafia boss out of Boston. And he heard indictments were coming down from a corrupt FBI agent. And he fled. And he ended up settling in Los Angeles. And a lot of these fugitives will do that. They will be on the run for a little bit, trying, you know, they're nervous. But then as the years go by, they become more comfortable that they're not going to be caught. And they end up establishing roots and staying in one place that they feel comfortable. And that's what Whitey Bulger did. And he ended up, I think it was in Los Angeles, he was finally caught. And uh, that's where he had stayed for many, many years. And he was arrested, and he was, I think he was in his 70s, too, where you know, he was beaten with uh, some locks in a sock so bad that his eyeballs popped out of his head for being an informant. So, it just goes to show you, you know, especially the mafia, they don't care that you're a senior citizen. You rat, you're going to get dealt with, and that's what happened to Whitey Bulger in prison. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but this guy, maybe that's what should happen to him. Okay. <clears throat> so still out there, Lester Eubanks, I would encourage anybody that's watching this, uh, please get on the Unsolved Mysteries episode, uh, webpage, get a picture of this guy, look him up on Google, look at the age progression, see if we can find him. Um, and another takeaway besides the stupid reform system that they were trying to do for these prisoners is the crime scene, okay? Th th that is my area of expertise. That, that is, you know, I pride myself on being able to look at crime scene photographs, seeing what's out of place, and doing a crime scene assessment. This one would have been tricky unless, you know, there's something in the report that I did not obviously read like her blouse was unbuttoned her skirt was pulled up okay you can infer sexual assault by that but if none of that has occurred and it's just gunshot 
and you'd want to look at the gunshot residue you know was there a stippling which means you know was the was the gun held up against the clothing and skin and if it was stippling would be present where black gunpowder essentially burns the clothes and the skin and that would tell you a lot too because you would know whether hey she was shot from a distance which again would totally lead me away from sexual assault or okay it was up close maybe something happened maybe there was a tussle because she was trying to get sexually assaulted so if i had that information that also may change my mind during the crime scene assessment step so that's all for uh this edition lester eubanks uh hey if you don't know me ken mains go to kenmains.com check out the history channel's hunt for the zodiac killer and see how we approached that you know decades old case in order to get closure and resolution to the families and uh i hope to uh do another one of these soon happy birthday united states marine corps semper fi all the veterans out there thank you for your service and until next time mains out